I'm, I'm also excited about the message I have for you this morning because Carol and I are going on holiday for two weeks. And this is the, uh, the last message before we go. Straight after this, we'll be uh, planning and ready to go for a... Uh, Carol deserves a rest, I tell you. But because um, we're going, I sense God wanted to share something. And this is what we're going to share this morning. We're going to talk about what would Jesus say to a skeptic. Not a septic, <laughs> not a septic tank, but a skeptic. And uh, so I want to talk in uh, John 6 about, you know, when Jesus, he's just fed 5,000 men with five loaves and two fishes. Now, in my book, that's a miracle, isn't it? I think, I'd like to think if I saw that, I would be um, absolutely in awe and wonder and Actually, it's interesting to see the reaction of the Jews. And you know it's in the book of John, the Gospel of John, when John generally, when he mentions the Jews, he's talking about the leaders. He talks about the people, but when he says the Jews, he's usually putting it in context of the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. So this encounter that we're going to look at in John chapter 6 is really an encounter with the leaders of the Jewish people and Jesus, after this miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, in fact, Jesus walked on the water as well. So they chased him down because they thought, well, there was only one boat and Jesus wasn't in it. So let's find out what he's doing. So can we turn together to John chapter 6 and verse 41 to 48 we're going to read. At this, the Jews there began to grumble about him. Because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them. And I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets. They will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Amen? Amen. And a skeptic... I looked it up in a few dictionaries. It basically means a person who maintains a doubting attitude. So someone who continually has a doubting attitude. And, and in fact, it's specifically used for those who have a doubting attitude about the truth of Christianity. The, the, it, the dictionary actually says doubts about the truth of Christianity. So a skeptic is someone who has doubts and um, grumbles about the truth of who Jesus Christ was. So these Jews that were coming to meet Jesus, they were skeptics because they said, well, this is just Joseph and Mary's son, isn't it? How can he say he came down from heaven? Whereas Jesus emphasizes, if you read in this passage, Jesus emphasizes this point. He mentions it six times that he came down from heaven. And that's the point. That's the one thing they pick on. You see how skeptics operate. They, the one thing they pick on is, so how can he say he came down from heaven? But it's interesting, isn't it? Because as we begin to look at what Jesus said, and bear with me here, um, we're going to grow into the conclusion by starting with what Jesus' first response was. Well, interestingly, his first response was not to answer any of their questions. He didn't address their doubts because the first thing he said is, stop grumbling. You know, I was uh, out with some of the guys on the streets a, wh a while ago, and I ended up talking with somebody, um, I can't remember who was with me actually, we were talking to this young couple, really nice young couple, um, and we began to talk to them, and they started asking questions, you know, that they had doubts. And so we answered their, their questions, um, or I felt we gave a good account of what they wanted to know. And then after we'd spoken to them for a while and we'd answered the questions, we said, would it be okay if we went through the gospel? 
And they said yes, and, and we spoke, um, we were able to share the good news of Jesus Christ. So after all this, at the end, we said, well, would you like to give your life to Jesus Christ? And the young man, he was quite disengaged. He, he stepped back. And the, the young lady, she said, no. And, and I said, well, you know, did you think what we said was true? And she said, yes. I said, well, would you like to give your life to Jesus Christ? And she said, no, but I don't know why I don't. And you see, sometimes the problem is that with people that are skeptical, you answer their questions and then they have more questions. So you say, if I gave you a reasonable answer to the questions you're asking, would you accept Jesus Christ? No, I wouldn't because I've got other questions. You know, people say, don't they, um, what about all the suffering in the world? Why does God allow all that, that suffering in the world? And, it, and um, I was listening to an, a well-known evangelist and he was saying, you know, that one way to approach that question is say, well, if I give you a reasonable answer to that question, will you then give your life to Jesus Christ? <laughs> well, no, I won't because I've got other questions. And Jesus didn't really address the skeptic who claimed that they were making. You know, the Jews were openly skeptical about this claim that Jesus came down from heaven. But he's just from Mary and Joseph. They weren't aware of the virgin birth. That their skepticism was, their attitude was blinding them to the truth of what he was saying. So the first thing he addressed is their attitude. He didn't answer their skeptical questions. He said, stop grumbling. Stop grumbling. And the reason he did that was because he was confronting their attitude and their unbelief. In John 6, 36, just a bit earlier, he said, but as I told you, I've already told you this, you have seen me and still you don't believe. Stop grumbling. And he was referring them back to when they were in the wilderness, the people of Israel, and the Lord provided miraculous food to, for them when they were stuck in the desert and he just delivered them out of Egypt. And what did they do? They grumbled. And Jesus was calling into question this grumbling attitude. Now, why was he doing that? Well, I believe it's because the whole thing of grumbling is about setting ourselves up above God. The grumblers set themselves, their opinions above God. God. What do I mean by that? Well, it's almost as if um, they say things like, oh, if only God saw things my way, I wouldn't be in this mess that I'm in. If only God did what I asked him to do, then everything would be fine. If only God could um, get what I want and get what I'm asking him, then everything would be fine. You see how the grumbling is basically saying, I know better than you, God. It implies that we know more than God. And these Jews, you see, they thought they were competent to pass judgment on Jesus. So he confronted their grumbling attitude as the first thing that he did. You know, the point is that grumblers won't believe in the truth of Jesus Christ, even if five loaves feed 20,000 people, 5,000 men and, and their families, and two fish. They, they still weren't believing it. They'd literally seen... Jesus take five loaves and feed 20,000 people at, at some people estimate were there that day. But the grumbling was stopping them engaging with that. Do you see what I'm saying? Because the root of unbelief is not a lack of evidence, but an attitude that wants to tell God how to run the universe. Or at very least, my little corner of the universe. There's plenty of evidence that's what I'm saying. Jesus had, pr had provided the most amazing evidence. And he said to them, didn't he? You're chasing after me, not because of who I am, but because you want me to feed your stomachs. John 7, 17. Jesus said this. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. You see that? The root of understanding and leading to faith is first of all a willingness to obey God. Jesus said, obey God, and then you'll find out if it's true. And you know that applies to our life as well. 
If we choose to obey God and to live for Him wholeheartedly, as we heard in the pre-service prayer, and give our lives for Him and follow what He commands, then we open up the truth over our lives. If we're constantly grumbling, then we're actually going to close off our eyes to the truth. Jesus faced Herod, didn't he? And Herod was going to hell. But Jesus didn't say a word to him. He didn't witness to him. And what about Jesus said, don't cast your pearls in front of swine. And sometimes an attitude can be so closed that we can't bring the truth. But other times, Jesus emphasized that if you submit to my lordship, then you're going to find out the truth. Jesus says to the skeptic, stop grumbling and thinking you know better than God. Start with your attitude. Confronting a lack of desire to submit to the lordship of Jesus is the start point for skepticism. And, and you know, it's not just unbelieving. We can be skeptical within the church, can't we? Yeah, that's right. Philippians 2.14 Paul says simply, do everything without grumbling. Why does he say that? Well, for the same reason. While we're grumbling about our circumstances, why is that not happening? Why is Graham talking about 4.12 again? When we're grumbling, we're blinding ourselves to what God can do in our lives. So when we submit to the Lordship of Christ, we open up such more wonderful truth over us. Come on. Come on. He's sovereign. His sovereign hand is over our circumstances. We can believe that because if we're grumbling, we're not giving thanks in all things. And that's that's what the Bible commands us to do, to give thanks in all circumstances. As we bring our requests to God, what do we bring them with? We bring them with thanksgiving, trusting in the Lord, submitting to his sovereign hand, being able to trust God. I loved what Alami said this morning. She started to feel a little bit ill again and she said, no. No, I resist the devil. I'm trusting in the Lord. It doesn't mean we won't have difficulties in our life. That's not what I'm saying. But we don't come to them with a grumbling attitude. So the first thing then in skepticism is, let's take out the grumbling from our lives and open up the promises of God over us. Secondly then, Jesus was saying to them in verse 44, so if we just read verse 44, it says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. And the word draws there literally means drags, to drag them. And I will raise them up at the last day. So what Jesus was really saying here is to these skeptics was, you've got a problem that you cannot fix. You want to come to the Father But you have a problem that you cannot fix. What do I mean by that? Well, the Jews believed that if they obeyed the law and they were passionate about the law and they bound the people by the law, then they were going to earn their way to God. But Jesus was saying, that isn't going to get you to the Father. It isn't going to get you to me. Unless you throw yourself on the Father's mercy, then you're not going to get to me. Because you can't fix this problem in your own strength. I was um, at Manchester Airport once. I I really apologize for this illustration for all the Liverpool fans in the room. (laughs) After last night's horrendous bashing. Sorry, guys. But I did put this illustration in before last night, I'm just saying. (laughs) I was at Manchester Airport and... Unbelievably, I was in the Flybe Lounge. I got into the Flybe Lounge, into the business lounge. It's the way to travel, folks. I can't even remember how I got in there. I don't get in there anymore. But I, I, I was in there. And someone told me what had happened the week before. And what had happened the week before is this young man had come up to the desk. And this young man was wealthy, successful, handsome, well-built, polite, humble, and the clue is on the screen, the most successful footballer on the planet. This guy has everything. I mean, he has good looks, skills, um, success. He's breaking records. He's got wealth beyond 
imagination. And he comes up to the humble flyby desk at Manchester Airport. Now, the lady behind the reception desk, she doesn't know who he is. <laughs> and so he stands before her and he says, um, please, can I come in? Would it be okay for, for me to come in rather than wait in the airport? And guess what she says? Can I see your flyby membership card, sir? Or words to that effect. <laughs> and uh, he says, well, I, I'm not actually a, a member. And so she says, sorry, sir, you can't come in. And, I mean, to his credit, this is what I'm told. I wasn't there. But uh, um, he turns around and he walks back out and doesn't argue. And then someone, one of the customers, comes up to the desk and says to the lady, do you know who that was? <laughs> that was Cristiano Ronaldo. And she said, I don't care who he was. He doesn't have a flyby membership card. He didn't come into my lounge. <laughs> But the point is, you can have everything in a worldly sense, but it's not going to get you into eternal life and into the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. You can be the perfect human being, but without being drawn by the Father through the mercy of Jesus Christ, you're not getting into the heaven. You're not getting into eternal life. Yeah. Everybody has to come through the same route, Amen. through Jesus. Yeah, that's right. Paul puts it like this in Galatians 2, 15 to 16. We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. By works, no one will be justified. And basically, Jesus was saying to these skeptics, look, it's not about you. I read David Pawson said, and I think it's such a truth. The problem with so many of us is we're so obsessed with what we think about God that we forget to be obsessed with what God thinks about us. Yeah, that's good. You know, oh, God, you feel so distant from me. Oh, oh I just feel like I'm going through such a hard time because God's not coming through for me. No, we cannot help ourselves. We have to throw ourselves on the mercy of God. Amen. The Jews wanted to make Jesus king on their terms. It says by force. And Jesus knew that it was wrong. It was going to be in, in line with works. And he said, no, you cannot come to me unless the Father draws you to me. And I think sometimes we think of salvation and following the Lord as like some kind of special offer. And Jesus is presented as a slightly pathetic character, pleading with us, oh, please give your life to me. You know, I, perhaps it's a misunderstanding of, you know, the verse that says, behold, I knock on the door. I stand outside and I knock on the door. But he's not talking about salvation there. He's talking about a church that is professing to know him already, and they've shut him out of his own church. We are, Jesus is not powerless, pleading, waiting for us to say, oh yes, okay, Jesus, we'll, we'll come to you. No, he's saying to these skeptics, you guys are powerless. John 1.13, to all who receive him, not of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Yeah. Amen. You see, we don't accept Jesus. Hear me right before you call me heretical here. Jesus accepts us. Yeah, that's right. We come to him and we say, Lord, forgive me. I'm powerless. I am helpless. I cannot do anything to earn this salvation, this eternal gift. And then by the mercy and the grace of God, he says, I accept you. I purify you. I cleanse you. Romans 15, 17, it says, accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Salvation and no, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is a miracle of grace, yeah. an Amen. undeserved gift of God. It's not like some Facebook friend request. You know, you get through these friend requests, don't you say, well, I don't know about him. Oh, I'll accept her, but I don't know about him. It's not weighing up whether... No, it's, it's absolutely a recognition of our helplessness in sin. 
without the mercy of God through Jesus Christ. What he did on the cross for us and conquering death and resurrection, that's the promise of eternal life. Jesus was saying to these skeptics, believe in me. That is the way to eternal life. We have to have the tax collector's attitude. You remember in um, Luke 18, where Jesus highlights the Pharisee who was praying with such pride and the tax collector who wouldn't even look up to heaven. He beat his breast, it says. He wouldn't even look up but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I was reading Spurgeon. I think Regina mentioned Spurgeon. And Spurgeon says, the C.H. Spurgeon, the, the theologian and preacher, he says, we should come to the Lord like a convicted criminal pleading for mercy to a king. He actually says, this is how we should pray. Oh God, if you choose to destroy me, I deserve it. If you never look on me with a kind expression, I can't complain or grumble. But save me, a sinner, Lord, for mercy's sake. I have no claim on you. And Peter puts it so beautifully in 1 Peter 1 verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus strips us of any proud self-confidence. The favorite notion of man is to think he can do what he likes. Is it not? I'll do what I want when I want. You know, we see in the world, it, it's coming true all around us. You know, I want to choose to live how I want to live. And you can't stop me. But Jesus says, no, you must have the opposite attitude. Get rid of the proud self-confidence in yourself and throw yourself on the mercy of God. And his promise is in his great mercy, he will give you new birth into a living hope. That's the wonderful promise of Christianity. Not repent or not repent or believe or not believe. Come to Christ or not come to Christ. Worship or not, you know, oh, well, I'll decide whether I'm going to worship this morning or not. You know, that's not what it's about. We have to recognize this powerlessness we have. Even salvation itself is not in our power. It's in his power. Amen. And Jesus says to these guys, these Jews in John 6, you know, man never begins with God. God begins with man. I know why you're grumbling. I know why you don't believe in me. You've got a desperate problem that only God can solve. You cannot come to me unless the Father draws you. We have to totally trust in Christ for our salvation. Amen. We have to come at his great mercy. And you know, I believe that's why in heaven there is such sparking of celebration when one sinner comes. Because one person has recognized their helplessness their lostness without the mercy of God through Jesus Christ. Yeah. And that is a reason for celebration, Amen. a reason for heaven to rejoice Amen. because someone who was blind can now see. Yeah. This skepticism and self-confidence stripped away and now eternal life Amen. for those who believe. Amen. And lastly then, so Jesus says, stop grumbling You've got a problem you, haven't got, you can't fix. And then wonderfully he says, and you know what? I am the answer. Yeah. I am the answer. He says in verse 47, very truly, and, and truly, truly, whenever there's a repetition in Scripture, you know it's an emphasis. That's what it's saying. So Jesus is saying, listen up. Truly, truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. The one who believes in who I am. Christ's witness to skeptics shows that he is the only way to know the Father. Not through mysticism or study or knowledge or human reason, but just Jesus Christ. Only through Jesus. And he encourages these skeptics with a magnificent promise that whoever believes has eternal life as a present possession. Amen. And as you and I give our lives to Christ... And if you haven't, then I pray you will this morning. Then you get eternal life as a present possession. It belongs to you now. But believes here is in 
The boring grammatical term here is in the present participle, i.e. it means we don't just believe in Jesus at the point of salvation, but we continue believing in him. An ongoing daily matter, a daily choice. John 3.16, you, you all know this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal, eternal life. You know it. John 10, 28, when Jesus talks about the sheep and, and the sheep knowing his voice, he says, I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. It's an implicit invitation to believe and an implicit warning against unbelief. He strips back all the pretensions of any would-be disciples, any self-congratulations, any agendas except those laid down by Jesus himself. That's how we're called to follow him, church. Those who believe Jesus can't follow him as if we're doing him a favor. No, his love for us is that if we obey his commands, we will have eternal life and we will be with him forever and no one will ever snatch you from his hand. Amen. I'm going to finish with my own testimony, you know. <laughs> I haven't shared this with you many times, but you know, when I was... A, a young man, I threw everything I had into my sport. I just was obsessed with playing tennis. I, I would bang up against the wall and irritate the neighbors for hours and hours on end. My dad, bless him, probably my neighbors wanted to kill him. He laid me a lovely patio with a, a tennis net on the g garage wall. And I would stay out there s for hours banging this ball. And I gave everything for it. And as I did it, I got m more and more successful. And um, I just was being fed off the, the glory. Do you know what I mean? I was, I was raising up thinking, this is in my control. This is so good. And then one day, after I had been skeptical about Christianity for years and years and years, I'd raised every question under the sun. And every time I got an answer, I had a better question. And for years and years, I'd been a pain in the neck. Just skepticism all over me, even though the truth was all before me. And then one day, I played this particularly important match, tennis match. And I did a Liverpool. <laughs> I failed big style. I lost this match, and not only did I lose this match, I lost my temper, and I threw my racket left, right, and center, and I had to go up to the, the people in charge afterwards and apologize, and suddenly, everything that I'd built in my world had come crumbling down, and I realized, you know, I'm just building into something that's going to crumble in the end. It, it's, you know, one day, you're always going to find someone better than you, and I wonder what your glory is, what you're feeding on today. Are you feeding on family? Are you feeding on career? Are you feeding on sport like I was? Are you feeding on intellect and, and knowledge? What, what are you feeding on today? What's the thing that you're building on? Because we sang today, didn't we? I will build my life on a firm foundation. And in that moment, all my skepticism suddenly had melted away. And I realized I was lost. And I went to church the very next day, the very next Sunday. And there was just one little testimony, one little prophecy. I've told you this before. A great big man about six foot six stood up. And in his farmer's accent, he said, somebody here needs to know that God loves them. And, you know, that was enough. The skepticism had gone. I realized I was helpless. And when God spoke, he spoke straight into my heart. Perhaps uh, whoever was playing, because I need to play for me. And, and you know, I think this is God's word for us this morning about what it means to Jesus to speak to a skeptic. Jesus says to a skeptic, he says, stop grumbling. Address your attitude. Secondly, recognize you've got a problem you can't fix. The Father, you can't come to the Father unless you come through me. You can't fix it yourself. Nothing you're going to do, no sport, no career, no academic achievement is going to get you to the Father. You have to come through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You may be living a filled life, but you're not living a fulfilled life. 
I was living a filled life, but not a fulfilled life. And then Jesus says, I am the answer. There's powerful evidence and testimony, but first come in faith to him. Cry out to the Father to draw you to Jesus through his undeserved miracle of grace. And that's what Jesus offers to a skeptic ultimately, a miracle of grace. And you may have skepticism in you this morning, and Jesus wants to offer you the miracle of grace. Why don't we close our eyes? First of all, you know, there may be people here who have never responded, have never had that encounter, that encounter with Jesus that says everything that I realized I was leading my life towards is worth nothing. I have to believe in Jesus to get that eternal life. Not that I choose to accept him, but I recognize that without him, I must throw myself on his mercy and ask him to accept me, forgive my sins, and give me eternal life as a now possession today. And if you've never done that, then today, why don't you suspend that skepticism and throw yourself on the mercy of God and receive the promise of eternal life Sins forgiven, the gift of the Holy Spirit to walk with you for eternity. Let's just pray together if you could repeat this prayer. Lord Jesus, I recognize this morning that without you I am helpless, that there is no way to eternal life without receiving your gift of grace. So today I say to you, forgive me, Jesus, for all the pride, for all the works, for all the things that made me think I could do it for myself. And give me the gift of eternal life as I put my faith in you, as I say, Jesus, you are Lord, and I choose to live for you from this day forward. Keep our eyes closed. If you have prayed that prayer this morning and uh, it's done something in your heart, meant something to you, um, I want you to come and speak to me actually afterwards because I want to pray with you. I want to bless you and see you blessed and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let's just keep our eyes closed because I just think there's one other area that the Lord wants to address this morning and that's here in the church family. Some of us have been struck this morning that we've been doing things in our own strength. We've been facing trials. We've been facing challenges. We've been looking into situations and we've, we're getting exhausted We're doing it in our own strength. And this morning, recognize that actually we have to allow that to to drain away and put our trust in God. To allow Him to be our hope. to, To allow Him to help us with our heart to live fulfilled, not filled. You know, to have Him alongside and not face that exhaustion that we always have of trying to do things on our own strength recognizing that actually doing things in our own strength is just a form of pride. When the mercy of God is that he wants to stand with us.